Hey everybody, in this video, I want to talk about the Microsoft Entra Security Service Edge portion of the overall Microsoft Entra solution, or SSE. Now I want to stress something. This, at the time of recording, is in a very early phase. Some of the parts are available for public preview, which I can talk about and show in a bit more detail. Some of it is in private preview, which I can talk about at a high level, but I cannot demonstrate it. That goes against uh, the rules of private previews. Once those things move into public preview, I'll do a more detailed video about those elements, and I'll try and explain that along the way. But I thought this is such an exciting technology, I did wanna create a video on it right now. I've done many videos in the past where I talk about the Microsoft Entra ID, formerly known as Azure AD, that becomes that cure perimeter, both giving me access to applications and controlling that access through the use of my authentication. So we think about identity as that security perimeter. Now I can think about, well, I have my Microsoft Entra tenant, so this is my specific Entra tenant. Again, I'm not gonna keep saying it, formerly known as Azure Active Directory. And the key point is with this tenant, this is where all my identities live for my users, my groups, etc. But what I will do is both applications I create but also things like the third-party SaaS applications. So over here, we have all those various third-party SaaS applications. Could also be things like Azure services. And they are trusting your tenant for the authentication. I also have things like my and this is an important point, my Microsoft 365 tenant, which I've also configured to trust and authenticate against my Entra tenant. I didn't mean to draw a Mickey Mouse up there. So if it's a cloud application, if it speaks modern authentication, hey, I tie it into my tenant, and great, all of the authentication, I get nice single sign-on for my clients. The other thing we can also do, if I think about it for a second, is I might also have my on-premises. So over here, I have my great big on-premises network. I'm giving myself a lot of space. And here, I might have web applications. So we're thinking HTTP. And what I'm installing there is we have this idea of an agent or connector Remember that agent establishes this outbound connection into my particular tenant. And the technology we're using here is app proxy. And then for each application I want to make available, this is an outbound connection. This now has network level communication to the app. And now I can just go and add a particular application to my tenant as an enterprise app, which then means it's just like any other app in my tenant. And for all of these different things, for all of these things that trust my particular tenant and I'm using it for the authentication, well then I can do the wonder that is conditional access. Here I can now have my conditional access so remember, it's gonna become this surrounding boundary, including these, for any of those attempts to access. And conditional access can look at many things, but it can include things like the user risk, uh, the particular sign-in risk for those real-time live signals. For some things, I have continual, continuous access evaluation. The ability that even if I've established and I have the token, well, for some critical type events, if they occur, such as a user session revocation, they change their password, user termination, maybe the client goes and moves to another location, we can revoke the token. 
And so the key part for all of these things, if I think about this, so all of these different scenarios we have right here, is it really boils down to the fact that, well, I have my user, and everything I'm trying to do is through that authentication. To get to any of these things, I have to be able to successfully authenticate, which is gonna give me these nice access token things. And once I have an access token, which to get, I have to have gone through the conditional access, my device has to be healthy, my risk has to be low, whatever those requirements are, then I can go and access all of these things that integrate from an authentication perspective with my particular entry tenant. And remember, through things like App Proxy, it doesn't even have to speak modern auth. It can still enable me to do pre-authentication, it can go and translate to header-based auth, it can do Kerberos, there's a whole set of things I can expose, but it has to be a web application, which is part of the challenge. Because, well, there are other things. I have other types of application. For example, maybe uh, over here I have, well, I have non-web apps. So this can't talk to it, I can't expose it, I can't get the conditional access, lovely stuff that I like. There's also, if I think about, the big wide internet. So I have everything else over here. And when I say internet, that could just be random sites, but these could also include things like other PaaS services, could be IaaS services, could even be other SaaS services that don't integrate with Entra for the authentication. And I also have the idea of not my M365, which again is just internet, but there's a twist here because I have my Microsoft 365 tenant, which I can apply conditional access policies to to control the access. But if it's someone else's my M365 tenant, well, then I have concerns maybe about, well, hey, someone connects to mine and then they connect to theirs and drops data. So we think about tenant exfiltration, data exfiltration challenges. And to solve that, what we think about is there are tenant restrictions. And we'll go into more detail on this, but the challenge is there's a lot of limitations to where those tenant restrictions can actually apply. And the key point here, therefore, is although we love the authentication and we think of the authentication as this key driving force to be able to do anything, there are just times where there are scenarios, it's not enough. I need to be able to hook in at the network level and make decisions there. Now, how do we solve this today, if I'm an organization, what are some of the things that I might do to give control over every single aspect that we just did? Well, what's very common today is if this was my on-premises network, what we would actually do, let's draw this in a, a gray color. We'll say, hey, look, we'll do, look at all these different colors we have now. We'll do it as a gray. We create a DMZ. So around this network, all the way around it, we have the idea of this DMZ, which sits between our internal network and the internet. And in this network, we put various things. We put things like VPN capabilities. So the whole point of a VPN is, well, hey, I can connect in to the VPN, and once I have VPN, well, I just then have free range to everything. It's all about a network segment. When I connect to a VPN, I now have connectivity to the network segment, which is actually not a great thing because I now have network level access to everything. But the VPN solutions are there. I may also put in proxy solutions. Now this proxy could be doing two things. It might enable controlled access out to 
the internet to other networks, hey, you can access this site but not these sites, I may also publish things. So like a reverse proxy, so I could get access to certain things here. We probably have things like firewalls. We might have various intrusion detection and prevention. There's a whole set of things I can do here. But this is all infrastructure. And in a cloud first world, as you can see, this, this is very limited to how useful it is. Uh, how do I manage it at scale? How do I put identity at the front of this? If I'm in the office, so if, hey, I'm here and I'm in the office, sure, when I try and access anything, I'm going via these services. But if I'm sitting at home, and I can't draw a house at all, but if I'm sitting, in my, you would have to have a chimney with smoke coming out. If I'm at home, none of this applies, unless I have to go and do this VPN, which puts me in this network segment. But that's a really important thing to understand. When I do these solutions, what this gives me is this network segment access, which in this zero trust world, we don't really like. Yes, a VPN is end-to-end -end encryption. It gives me those private communications. But if there is one compromise, once I've compromised this, I'm then got unlimited access. I think the Colonial Pipeline was an example of, hey, a compromised credential, and then I've got access to everything. This is where zero trust network access comes in. I want to validate every single access to some access of resource. And again, I can only access other private resources if I'm in this network segment. So we, we're trying to move away from this. It's very hard to manage at scale. It's hard to put identity at the front of this. And more and more now, people are not living inside this little network that has to go through this DMZ to get access to stuff. And so what's the, what's the new solution? And so what we think about now is this idea of secure access service edge, or SASE. You can almost think about it as I'm gonna lift and shift this stuff, but I'm gonna move it into the cloud. So I'm gonna draw a, our new service. I'm gonna make it quite big so I don't actually know how much exact space I'm gonna need. But now we have, I'm gonna talk specifics about the Entra. So it's the Entra SSE, that's Secure Services Edge. Now there are a number of different components that make this up, and we can kind of see those here. I can think about firstly a secure web gateway. So we can have an idea of an SWG. So I can think about that as internet. Hey, I want to control when people want to access a site, it's only sites we want them to. That might be controlling categories of site. Hey, you can't look at gambling, you can't look at violence. It might be I want to help protect from malware. It might be I want to help look at intrusion detection and threat intelligence. Not all of those things will be available day one, but I think it's going to grow over time. So, hey, I want to give control to access to the internet. We can think about zero trust network access. So over here, I might do zero trust network access. So this is all about giving access to private resources. So you might think a lot about that's replacing the old VPN type, but in a different way. We want to move away from the idea of a VPN that just gives me this network segment access. We don't like that. We want to think about application individual segments and being very granular at how we give those controls. We don't want this broad network access at all. Uh, we think about things like CASB, um, the Cloud Access Security Broker, to help enforce policy, to help discover um, bring your own IT, discover cloud applications you're using, understanding the threats that are available, giving me that visibility. So I have the idea of CASB solutions. And then traditionally, we'd also think about things like an SD-WAN. Um, branch to branch connectivity, site to site connectivity. Now today, this is not really in the focus of this. Now obviously, Azure has things like Azure VWAN, a managed hub that could help with that. But it's really those first three that are the focus of the Entra SSE. And obviously the, the CASB solution has been around in 
Microsoft for a very, very long time. So we wanna ensure one of our key goals here, the user's identity is always validated no matter what they're trying to access. Hey, an internet, uh, Microsoft 365, other private applications. We wanna make sure the security posture is valid and their device is valid. And it needs to work no matter where they are. You have to move away from this, okay, well, it only works if they're in here, or okay, we're gonna make them VPN in here first, which is then this entire network segment, which giving them an IP from this network segment, and then they got free reign. We wanna move away from just that network segment idea. And so by moving these features into the cloud, we can make them available for anywhere. And a key point I wanna stress is that we talked about how, how do you handle this at scale? Think of the COVID, suddenly everyone was working from home and there were companies that had huge challenges with scaling to this. So if we think about from a scale perspective, realize of course, that this is running on Microsoft's network. This is on the Microsoft global network. So when you think about scale and size, this is the Microsoft WAN. So you think, well, the 70 plus Azure regions are connected to this. 170 plus edge locations. So no matter where I might be around the world, there's an edge location on the Microsoft WAN so I can connect with very, very low latency and get the service. I think there's something like 20,000 peering connections on this thing, two petabytes um, per second of capacity. So it's just a huge, huge global network. So no matter where I may be, there's gonna be an edge location close to me on that Microsoft global network. And the really important thing is when I, I draw all of this stuff, is this conditional access is gonna follow this all the way around. So all of these offerings they are going to get the benefit of my lovely conditional access and all of that great risk-based, for some of them continuous access evaluation. I'm gonna get all of those capabilities. So this is the point. Okay, so, so how is this going to work? So I have the user, no matter where they may be. And as the user, well, they have their device. So I can think, well, they have their computer. Very oh, old style computer, apparently, as as advanced as I can possibly draw. And what it's gonna have is a new client. So as part of this solution, what it's going to install on this is the global secure access client. So installing on this, global secure access client. Now this is gonna vary based on platform, and I'll come back to that in a second. But what it's really gonna do is establish a tunnel to the various services. So I can think about which well, this thing that's gonna establish this tunnel. Now I'm drawing a tunnel. It's not gonna be a tunnel. But this is gonna connect to services that act as a traffic relay for these different types of service that can then force and impose the various requirements. Now, it would apply to both bring your own device and manage devices, but initially today, the scenarios are focused around managed devices, i.e. it's a corporate device. But again, this could expand in the future. Now you can also, and they've talked about this, there's also the idea of enabling at a network level. So there is also a concept over here of remote network connectivity. Now, today I think this is gonna use a site-to-site -site VPN. In the future it could actually hook into other types of SD-WAN appliance to provide that. So this will be a scenario of ordinarily we wanna put this client on devices. Imagine I had a guest in my network but I still wanted to control what they visit when they're on my network. 
So then this could apply. Now this would not be all of the different scenarios we're gonna talk about. This would be focused on, hey, they're trying to look at the internet and Microsoft 365 traffic. So when we start talking about things like private access to things, this would not apply to that. I, I have to, again, I wanna be very, very granular on that. Otherwise, it's really just starting to then connect two networks together, which I don't wanna do. This is not gonna connect this network to a network. This is gonna connect this network to those traffic relay and inspection services that we have over here in the Entra SSC and then apply those conditions. Well, if it was a private app access, I don't, then I'm, in many ways, I'm just connecting the network to an application segment, which is not something we probably want to do. So at the location level, it's more focused on, hey, if you want to access this internet or a certain M365 tenant, I want to be able to put controls in there. And it is a unified solution. So as you're gonna see, I'm gonna talk about a number of different types of technologies, and we talked about it here. Hey, look, control of the internet, control to private apps, has be. This is one unified solution. It is one client, it is one portal, it is one conditional access capability. It has the same security capabilities. It is an identity-centric SSE solution. It's also gonna give me certain visibilities into the different IPs the client is using, even though I might be going through a proxy service. I'm gonna be able to expand it with custom metadata. And there are different components that are gonna enable this, but the key thing, I'm gonna get tunnels. I'm gonna get different tunnels going through this. Now the tunnels are going to use uh, gRPC, which means it's running over HTTP2. The huge great thing about gRPC is what it's gonna do is yes, it's gonna establish it outbound that way, but then there's a lot of flexibility in what it can actually do in the future and how those communications can flow. So let's talk about this client for a little bit. So absolutely, it's a unified client for the different scenarios we're gonna talk about. Um, I can stop it, I can pause it. If we jump over super quickly, so here, this is a machine where I'm obviously I'm running the client. We'll come back to the idea of channels, but you can see, hey, look, they're healthy. There's three channels right here, private internet M365. I can, if I jump down to the bottom, you can see, hey, look, I can switch users. So the client is authenticated as a certain user because again, it's gonna go and get policies that apply to me and cache some of that on the client that it can use to go and check and what traffic it should be inspecting. I can pause, resume, restart, get logs, do a check on the client and connection diagnostics. And it's the connection diagnostics that I'm running up here. I can see some of the services. So we can see, hey, look, the tunneling service, the management, the policy retriever. So it's getting those different bits of information. I can see just some basic summary of when the policy was last updated. And then what I can go and look at is things like, hey, the flows that are happening through here and the host name. So the host name is, hey, I'm doing a DNS entry, a DNS lookup, and I can see basic things that, hey, it's looking for client.wns.windows.com. Well, ordinarily, the IP address would have been this one, but we're getting instead this magic IP, 6.6 something. So magic IP, is what is that entra edge solution because we're not talking directly to things we're going to talk via these tunnels to these special magic ips and then we just get these layer four flows so we have great visibility if i need to to go and see everything that is happening within there now the client itself, so let's break this down into the, the different options. So Windows, I'm obviously showing it on Windows, and Windows is where they're starting. At time of recording, it's focused around Windows. So obviously, yep, we can run this on Windows. Now in Windows, it's a standalone installer. Now that means a standalone installer, I could install it through any of the means we normally install apps on Windows. I could use an MDM solution, I could use group policy, I could have a script, I could use Intune, it's just getting installed. Now, in Windows, it's gonna install a network filter. 
So this network filter driver, then all packets will flow through. And then if the packets match the pattern that it's pulled down through the policy, then it's like, well, okay, I need to go and send it to that secure services edge. So it's not just blindly sending everything. It has policies for the types of traffic flow it needs to go and look at. So it is a standalone installer. It can be Azure AD joined or hybrid joined. And they've talked about later on that this client would actually become part of the operating system in their initial launch video where they mentioned that. But there will be other OSs as well. So I think there'll be, you'll have things like Mac OS. You'll have things like iOS and Android. Now, one of the interesting things is for these mobile platforms, it will become part of the Defender um, app. Because these mobile platforms have restrictions on how many different VPN clients can be active at any one time. Well, other Microsoft solutions use these mini tunnel ideas. So the functionality will be merged into one and then each different subset of functionality can establish its own tunnel. It doesn't mean I have to use Defender as a functional area or pay for that as a Defender solution. It's just they're gonna have this unified client to handle those tunnels. Um, I think also Linux is probably on the way. So we'll be able to have all those different operating systems. Um, so we have the client, we have the diagnostics, and again, there is that idea of the remote network integration. So I have the client. Okay, fantastic. So what? Well, now I can think about the different buckets of traffic that I actually care about. I can think about, well, there are those resources out on the internet. And even the, the internet, we divide into two buckets the stuff that is Microsoft 365 and the stuff that is not Microsoft 365. And then there's private stuff. So there's two distinct areas we want to provide access to. And so we'll start off talking about the internet access side. So if we come over here, I wanna break it into the distinct buckets that this client may actually go and use. So let's start with internet first, and what, what color should we use for internet? I don't know, we use that. Actually, we use purple. So first thing we have is internet. So I'm gonna draw internet over here. And remember, as a sub part of internet would be Microsoft 365 traffic, but it is separate. Uh, Microsoft 365, remember, already has very rich capabilities, it has its own um, security solutions, its own intrusion solutions, it has its own apps defining conditional access already. So you want to treat that a little bit differently to how you might treat other generic internet patterns. You don't want these things tripping over each other. So they are treated um, differently. But when I think about the internet, well, that would be all of the things. General internet sites might be IaaS and PaaS non entra integrated or SaaS applications. And what's gonna happen is this type of network traffic is gonna now get treated as a special type in conditional access. So if we go and look at conditional access for a second, and let's just go and look at our protection, conditional access, policies, and I'll create a new policy, and my target resources, what you now see is this global secure access. And if I select that, you have the different types of traffic available. Now remember, I talked about there are different capabilities in different stages. Internet is in private preview today. So internet, I can't show you any details. I am on the private preview, but I, you can't show it while things are in private preview. But hey, I can do distinct things about Microsoft 365 traffic. Private traffic is public preview, but as we're gonna see public preview, sorry, the private traffic I treat a little bit differently, and I'm gonna actually demonstrate how we do that. But we do get this new type of traffic exposed to us. And so let's think firstly about that internet traffic. So we have the idea of the secure uh, web gateway. Now for everything we ever do, I'll just show you the key point. 
before the global secure access feature can actually start to do anything, we have to configure traffic forwarding. You have to go and turn it on. Now, again, you would see, if you're on the private preview, another box to check that would be internet profile. You can't see it because it's private preview, but there would be a third box here. But notice I have enabled it for Microsoft 365 profile, the private access profile, and it's also enabled for the internet profile. And you know they're enabled because again, if you go and look at the client, remember, if you look at the channels, it has established a channel for private internet and M365. So you know that has been turned on and it has established the channels for that. Because that's really an important point around these things. So if we go and look at well, how this is actually going to work, the three types of traffic that this supports, I'm not gonna do private yet, but each of these is a separate tunnel. So for internet traffic, it has established a tunnel. One of these, GRPC, again, there's not a generic tunnel, I just drew the tunnel there, but there's a specific tunnel for internet. There's also a specific tunnel for M365. So they have been established. Let's start with internet. So if I think about just general internet type traffic, what are things I am likely gonna want to do? Well, and you can actually see it in the screen. So if we looked at the screen, although it's private preview, and if I click it, it won't do anything. It just says, hey, you need to sign up, but there's a special browser. But we can see it's gonna make you do a web filtering set of policies and then policy profiles. So it, it tells us, and again, that they've shown some of this stuff already. So what we have to do first is define the web filters. So in here, I will go and add web filters. So one or more web filters. And this is just a combination of FQDNs and also there are built-in categories. So I might create a web filter that maybe I've defined as, I don't know, non-corporate. And maybe I tick gambling and violence, but also I add some fully qualified domain names of youtube.com. I don't want people spending their time on YouTube at work. Or wildstar.youtube.com. So it would apply to www.youtube.com as well. But I create a number of web filters. And I'm not saying allow or block. I'm just saying, hey, I'm defining these things. And then what I add and go and create are one or more policy profiles. And a policy profile is where I link n number of the web filters I've defined, and then I can go and say, well, is it allow or block? Uh, I can set a priority, because there might be scenarios where I add in a bunch of, hey, block social sites, but then maybe there's a particular one that I need for business. Maybe I have a corporate Twitter and I would add, well, actually I've got a web filter just for star.twitter.com that I have a higher priority that's set to allow. So I allow a block and then priorities. So I create the policy. And then once I have the policies, well, then I can just use the policy as part of a conditional access. And that's what we see here. So if we jump over if I go back to that idea of conditional access, we go to protection again, conditional access, policies. If I'm in the private preview, and you can actually see I've got one down here, but I can't show that one. If I, what I would have is this global secure access, I would have checked internet. So that would be checked, say, hey, I want to do internet traffic. And then once you check that box, I can then in session controls, you would see another box down here that would let you select the profile. And that's all it's gonna do. Now obviously, then you put in the grant. The grant might just be, uh, obviously I'm blocking it, because I'm doing denying those controls, or it might be, rather than block, I might grant, but I want MFA, or I want it to be a compliant device. 
So all I'm doing is I'm defining those traffic patterns, the FQDNs or the categories, and now I can use that policy that's got a bunch of those included, and I can apply conditional access to it. Now again, that policy, if it was blocking, it's just gonna block the access. But if it was allow, hey, I'm gonna allow access to these sites, but my conditional access policy is gonna require MFA or require a healthy device or whatever those things might be. Um, and they've talked about on the roadmap, there'll be things like TLS inspection and termination, um, threat detection, IDP. So we'll have all of those different capabilities. And uh, essentially at that point, it would lock it down. Now again, if I just tried to, I, I've got one running and I, I'm blocking YouTube. So if I try and go to youtube.com, it won't let me because I'm blocking it. But if I go to savletech.com, it's not blocking it. So I can go and get access. So you can see those things. And what's great is you can see the full log of, look, hey, look, it tried to do a, a DNS in the client. So when it looked it up, hey, there would be a normal record it would have responded. But no, I get a response to talk to that magic IP via my lovely tunnel. And then in the flows, I'll see the layer four flows where, hey, look, I can see Savletech. And for my Savile Tech, hey, it goes and talks to a Magic IP. So uh, I, I can, that client is really nice. It lets me go and see all of these great things. So that's what I can think about with, hey, internet traffic. And again, I can't go into details right now, but when it goes into public preview, we can talk more about it. But then there's this idea of the Microsoft 365 tunnel. And the big deal with Microsoft 365 is it's all about data exfiltration. The idea that, hey, I can lock down the Microsoft 365 services through conditional access already. There's, there's huge CA support for that. But where it gets weak is, well, what stops someone copying something to someone else's SharePoint? So I want to have control and be able to restrict using a different tenant. So we want these tenant restrictions. Now tenant restrictions exist already. They're in our conditional access, sorry, uh, in our policies. So if I go and look at identity and look at external identities, we have cross tenant access settings. In here I can configure default settings and I can also set org specific settings. So in default settings, you can see outbound, and you can see tenant restrictions down here. So as by default, I could block everything that isn't part of my tenant. I can also do particular tenant restrictions. So here, if I look at this onboard to Azure and I scroll over, I can do tenant specific restrictions. And again, I can do, hey, I wanna block access to external users or block access to the applications. And what you have to pay attention to is this stuff. So the way it would normally work is I'd have to take that tenant ID and policy ID, and then I have to plumb it into the client. I would actually have to take those tenant restrictions I've defined and get it into that Windows operating system. Now there's group policies I can use to take that policy ID and the restrictions ID, and I can plumb it into there but it only works for Windows. And um, there's, there's certain things from the Edge browser. If I don't want it to be limited to that, I have to go and plumb it into things like my proxies and my Edge, but then it only works for the auth plane, not the data plane. So there's a lot of limitations to the way tenant restrictions can work today. Well, with this, the GSA client, it completely changes that. So what I can now do is I can turn on tagging. So if I go back to my global secure access, and if I go to my global settings and session management, we see this option for tenant restrictions. And enable tagging to enforce tenant restrictions on your network. So what this now does is provided I have that global secure access client installed, it's gonna enforce that and it's gonna enforce it anywhere I have that client installed. Now again, the client today is super early days, we're in super early preview, 
But if you think about it, when I have that client everywhere, well now those tenant restrictions would apply for every client. I could stop, maybe there's particular orgs I want to block, or I want to block everyone and only allow certain orgs. Whatever I've defined in my tenant restrictions will now be enabled through that. So this is a really powerful capability to now be able to do that tagging of the traffic. So the whole point here is with this solution, we can turn on that tagging. So the tenant restrictions are just always going to apply. Now there's also a lot of other things it does. And there's very rich logging, there's dashboards, I can export them to many different types of service and SIM. It's also gonna enrich the data. So one of the things we see is, well the actual IP address that the service sees is not mine, it sees one of these magic IPs because remember it's relaying the traffic. So my logs ordinarily would show the magic IPs. That gets less useful if I'm trying to think about detecting risk. I don't want to obfuscate the client IPs. So one of the great things this will actually do is it enhances um, the metadata. So for Microsoft 365, it will add the original client IP. It would add things like the device ID, the operating system. So those logs will still have very rich controls. And they've talked about other capabilities are coming. The other really nice thing I can do is this idea of a compliant network check that's powered by this GSA client. So if we think about conditional access, what I'm also gonna be able to as one of these checks is the idea of compliant network check. Now this is not specific to Microsoft 365 traffic. With Microsoft 365 traffic, it can also work for the data plane, which is really nice. But it will work for any modern auth app. So if I have other SaaS applications that are tied into my entry for the authentication, I'll be able to use this compliant network check. And how I can think about this is we have locations today. And locations today, we have to define in terms of IP addresses. So um, I, I wanna, while I'm here, I should show this. So we have this idea of adaptive access. So I'm gonna turn this on to enable secure access signaling in conditional access. So it's enabling this client IP restoration, it's used by continuous access, continuous access evaluation, conditional access, signing logs. But it also, as it talks about here, restrict access based on the global secure access client. So it has to get that signaling. So the idea is, normally, if I was doing conditional access, I could define locations. So I can create named locations, based on sets of IP addresses, maybe countries, but there's a lot of overhead to go and define all of those IP ranges. So what I can do instead is when I think about the conditions and locations, instead of it being one of those named locations, I can say all compliant network locations. So this is now automatically managed for me. If I have that GSA client, which can then enforce all of the other things, I don't have to worry about now managing a set of IPs that may be public facing. And that again is gonna work for any Azure AD integrated apps on, for the authentication and the data path, that continuous access evaluation for M365 will work. And this now, can be really powerful. Like I could combine this, hey, all compliant network locations to say only if you have this, can you access my Microsoft 365 tenant? So now I'm combining two things together. I can say, hey, as part of my policy, yes, you can access my M365 that I've defined, but only if you've got this compliant network check. So only if you're coming from, hey, I've got the GSA or I've got that um, remote connectivity installed there, which would then ensure I have the client, which would ensure my tenant restrictions are being enforced. 
So now I can completely lock it down and I'm not having to manually worry about sets of IPs and where things are coming from. So that is a really powerful capability. The other bucket we have, so let's think about this for a second. So we talked about internet, we talked about M365, each their own tunnel. So the other one is private. And once again, this is its own tunnel. So now my focus is I want to go and connect to applications that are on a private network. Now I draw it as on premises, but it doesn't have to be on premises. This could just be, it could be a VNet in Azure, it could be a VNet in another cloud. It's some network that I don't have public access to. And what I wanna be able to do is enable access to those applications. Now, the way we've done this historically is with at proxy. We have the agent running in the network, and what we do is we create this public facing URL, a fully qualified domain name that I can connect to. It does the authentication. Normally we pre auth with that. That has established an outbound connection. And then it has network level connectivity to the app, but it has to be a web app and I can access it. And because it gets added as an app, I can apply conditional access. But what about these non-web apps? We want to enable those as well. So now we can. Now as always, as I've kind of shown a million times, for this to work, we have to enable that traffic forwarding. So we have enabled this private access. We have to do that. Once you've done that, it's gonna establish the tunnel from the client. And now I can start to make these things available. Now what it's gonna do is today we have these connectors. So we have this agent today for at proxy. We're gonna replace that. So this agent, let's just remove this agent. We'll take this away. And instead we're gonna replace it with uh, the new connector, this new private access connector. So we're gonna have this new private access connector. And just like before, we can have N number of them for resiliency and scale. Now, this replaces the old app proxy one. So it does both jobs. So app proxy is still gonna work. I basically replace it with a brand new version that still supports my app proxy so it still supports this, but, and it establishes for my private access. And so you can see it's built on a lot of the goodness and the learnings they got from app proxy, but it's taking it to a completely different level. It's now any protocol not just web. So if now if I think about down here, this idea of non-web apps, it talks to those as well. So non-web apps could be RDP, it could be SSH, could be FTP, could be SMB, uh, it could be a printer, it doesn't care. Now it is focused on non-web apps. Yes, I could add an app that is port 80 or 443, but it's not doing layer seven. So it's not looking at the path, for example, it's only looking at the fully qualified domain name. It's treating it as a TCP app, not a HTTP app. So I wouldn't be able to do that distinguishing segmentation based on path, for example. There would be no single sign on, which I get with web today. So today I would carry on using app proxies functionality for the web apps I wanna make available via a public URL. I think over time I would fully expect them, there'd be more convergence on this, again, it's early days. But yeah, I really think about these as non-web applications. Point of note, if you play with this, you cannot just upgrade the current connector, you have to uninstall it, delete the program files folder, and then reinstall the new one. 
So if we go and look at our environment, then we look at my connectors. So I have two. Notice it even says that proxy. I have two of them, but I had to uninstall the old one and then reinstall the new one. But these are now active. So these are gonna work for both app proxy and for these private applications. That's really the key point. Now for this to work, we're still gonna have to add these applications to Entra so it knows about them. So if we go back over here, if I think about my Entra tenant, my overall Entra solution, what I'm gonna have to do is add private access applications. And there's actually two types. I can create one, but only one, quick access. Now the point of the quick access is maybe today I have a VPN and I want to quickly just enable a bunch of connectivity to a bunch of things on a network and I'll come back to it later and tune it up a bit. But I can only create one of these. Now I can create n number of just apps. Now what we're doing with all of these is again, we wanna move away from just broad network access. So we define these in terms of application segments. I want to be very, very specific. Now I can define those application segments as a particular IP address. It could be an IP range. It can be an IP CIDR, which is just a different way of writing an IP range. It could be a particular fully qualified domain name. I also then specify the port. Now what is really, really important, there can be no overlap. This is not like when we do IP routing and I might have a hey uh, slash uh, 20 route and then I have a more specific slash 29 route and whole. The nice thing it will do for me is the longest match is what will win and it will use that. It will not. If I have an overlap, I will get unpredictable behavior in the network filtering on the client. It may work, but it may not do what I'm expecting. So I need to be really careful to not overlap these. And so what you'll see is you have to, if I do this quick access, I need to make sure, for example, IP addresses I'm gonna add as particular apps cannot be part of the application segment I define for the quick access. It will not work. Now, you notice I can do fully qualified domain names in here, i.e. DNS. The client does not have to be able to resolve those. So let's say I put in some, my domain controller. I do not have to have DNS resolution to that name at all. What's gonna happen is that fully qualified domain name will get plumbed in via the update of the policies. So it now knows about it and it knows, hey, if I see that name, I'm gonna go and talk to this, which will resolve it for me. The only thing that has to be able to actually resolve the fully qualified domain name are the connectors. Because that's what actually has to really go and find the IP address and communicate. So I can absolutely put in private, fully qualified domain names that are only visible on the network the client does not have to have any DNS resolution for those. It's gonna carry on working. Now, if we go and look at this for a second, so I have obviously enabled the traffic forwarding already, as we talked about. So then what I have to do is I have to define those as applications. And you'll see I have two types, quick access and enterprise. So I can have one quick access. And you'll notice I can add in, if I do my edit over here, that would actually show me the main um, enterprise app for it so that they're still defined, it's still defined as a regular enterprise app. But I could add a new segment and here I can see the different types of segment. So IP address, CIDR, IP ranges, or fully qualified domain name. And what you see, what I have done here, and you might see a little bit weird, I did two, uh, zero to nine, 
and then 11 to 255, all of them RDP. Because I can't overlap. So I have this general quick access where I could add a whole bunch of general things. And again, it becomes its own enterprise app so I could do certain conditional access applying to it. Then what I also did is I added a specific app. So when you do a new application, again, you specify it to a certain connector group because I could have different groups that might have access to different internal networks. I would add its particular, and again, it can have multiple different app segments that make this up. But what I did is I created an RDP to my domain controller. And if I select it, it will show me the enterprise app. And what I can do is look at the network access properties, which will show me what I did here. So I specified two different ways I could talk to it. It's IP address, which is why I couldn't have dot 10 as part of quick access. Remember, cannot overlap. And I did its fully qualified domain name. All of them 3389. Now, once I have this added, remember, I can apply conditional access. And what we'll actually notice, I did. I added a particular MFA for my domain controllers. So my target resource is just a cloud app. I'm not using that special global secure access because it's now defined as an enterprise application. But what I've configured here in the grant, I'm requiring a specific authentication strength. So I have to use the Authenticator app. That's what I have defined as required for this. Now realize these are just regular apps now. I could go and add things like custom properties. All of those different things, I could add a custom security attribute, and I could trigger conditional access off of those like I've done in other videos. I can use all of the same goodness as conditional access I have ever done. Now the other important thing I have to make sure I've done, both for quick access and this, is I do assign it to users. So for my domain controller, I've assigned it to me. And then obviously for the quick access, uh, find it super quick. Where's my apps gone? There we go. Again, it's just here, I would see quick access, and I've assigned it to me as well. So they've all been assigned. So now as the user, let's close down the browser. I want to connect to that domain controller. Now, let's look at something interesting. Now this may work actually because I've already used it. If I did an NS lookup, SAV Azure US South Central DC01, .savletech.net. Now it resolves it, but notice what it's resolving it to. It's one of those magic IP addresses, and that's because on this machine, I previously done a connection to it. But it's not its regular IP address. That is not, it has no resolution to its normal name. So if I now try and connect to it, so let's do a MSTSC. And let's connect to that box. Now what this is now doing, and then notice what's happened. And this is very unusual. So what's happened right now is that client, I've tried to establish a TCP session via the relay cloud over to this. And it knows as part of the policy, well, no, no, there's a conditional access policy that requires you to have done an authenticator app level interaction, which I've not done on, I don't have that token already. So if we jump back over again, so it's making me do a strong auth. So it's, even though it's RDP, and this would work the same for SSH or anything else I'm doing. So now I have to go and do the, I'm on my app and I'm doing it. Now this is gonna fail and I'll explain why it's gonna fail. So now I've done the strong auth, good, good, and it's failed. Um, why has it failed? So. Hostname acquisition, it would have, well, it probably cached already, but if I was looking for enough, I'd probably see it trying to connect to that box, but my eyes are failing me right now. Oh, there it is, I'm being silly. So it, it got it. Now notice its original was all zeros, like, uh, no connectivity, but it got it to a magic IP in that SSE cloud. 
But remember what happened is the client is not letting my TCP session go through at all. It, it's stopping it. And so what happens is I'm trying to establish a TCP session. And if I go and look for that particular machine, it took 50 seconds because I was sitting there chatting to you and then I had to go to the app. So it was a cold path and it timed out. But it does actually show it's getting in the middle of the TCP session I'm trying to establish, which the RDP is going to run over. But now my machine has that strong auth token. So if I try and connect again now, it won't do all of that stuff again. Now it will just go and do the regular connection. And it's going through. So we can see the session is going through and I'm connecting to that machine. And so that was really the key point here. So I was enabling conditional access for on RDP. This would work for SSH or FTP because it's interacting with it earlier on. This is hooking in as I'm trying to do that session, the client, remember, is getting fed the policies. That network layer is getting in the middle saying, no, no, you need to meet this requirement first. Makes me do the strong authentication, then it lets the traffic flow that layer for you. Saw that how long it took. In fact, if we actually go and look at the client, that'd be fun. How long did the second flow actually take? So what we should see is a newer flow that should be much, much faster. So there's the new one, 3389. So it's, there's our new one. And the time was there. That time is really fast. Oh, I think it's scrolled off the screen again. Hold on. It's the only problem when I'm doing all this stuff. There we go. Okay, so there it is. 3389. It was fast. So that's why it didn't time out. I didn't have any issues this time. But that traffic flow, if we look at it, so it's this line, we'll see in terms of what it's going over, the different tunnels, it's going over that private tunnel. So we can see that's at play and that's how this is actually working. So this Secure Access Client Connection Diagnostics is fantastic. The visibility it gives me into everything that's happening is awesome. And while we're talking about visibility, and again, it's very, very early days. This is not all there yet. But you also have monitoring. Like there's the whole set of traffic logs, for example, where I can go and see everything that's happening. Was it allowed? Did it fail? If I try to access, for example, the M365 different tenant, that onboard uh, to Azure one I blocked, it would fail. It wouldn't allow me to do that. I can see enriched logs. Um, if I've enabled that. And I think, again, this is being built out as audit logs, as workbooks, but they're gonna add all these different functionalities in to give me the visibility into all these different areas. Now you may wonder, well, how do, how do I get this stuff? Licensing, I don't know what licensing is yet. I can tell you for the M365 part, that's just part of your existing E3 or above SKU. There's no additional cost for that, so if I am already licensed for M365 E3 or above, I can just use this and get those tenant restrictions applied. And again, the other goodness they're gonna be adding, there's no additional charge, it's part of your existing license. I do not know what will happen around the internet and the private, how that's licensed, they've not disclosed that yet. But that's the all up solution. Um, I hope it's useful, I hope it clarifies what it is. So it's one unified solution in terms of this new Entra SSE, one unified client, one unified interaction with conditional access, take that existing knowledge and skill I have, but now I can apply it in a lot of more places. I can apply it to any internet site by defining these web filters and policies and applying it. I can now enforce tenant restrictions to stop that data exfiltration without having to either only work on a Windows client or have to do limited authentication plane by hooking IDs into my <coughs> proxies and my location. I can now access any application. And the key point is now this is gonna work anywhere. 
I'm taking those things that really previously only worked in a certain level if I was in a certain network, or I had to VPN in, which then is this network level access, which if there's a compromise is a problem, I've taken the capabilities and put them in the cloud with the cloud scale and the cloud's connectivity, and I bring it no matter where you are. And that's really the key point around all of this. So it's exciting um, to add those capabilities to what we could already do through the authentication level controls and conditional access. It basically makes, it really is everything now. I can make available and control. And I said this before about the entry, and I think of it as a kind of the entrance to the world. It truly now, hey, I can use this as a way to open up everything, but the same way an entrance has locks, I can control everything as well. So I think that's really neat. Um, hope this was useful. Until next video, take care.